Welcome everybody, Thursday night, women's class, Riyadh al-Salihin, plus the fiqh of marriage. We've got a lot of juicy marriage issues to get into. So I'll try to be strict with the 20 minutes, the half of the time for the uh, Riyadh al-Salihin. We were talking last class about um, Abu Huraira. We talked about his biography, and we started to talk a little bit about some of the doubts that Orientalist scholars have raised about his reliability. Could he really memorize as many hadith as he memorized? Was it really possible? Um, and I had kind of mentioned in a um, general way, uh, sort of how to respond to this sort of doubt that's been raised, but I was kind of struggling to be timely. And so I didn't really um, recall the specific text. It's in Arabic, of course, um, but just for those who are interested, um, because some people will, will cherry pick quotes that, yes, there were companions as well that were kind of alarmed or surprised or even skeptical that Abu Huraira could memorize so many hadith. And so there were some people who doubted him in his lifetime, both among the companions and from uh, their successors, the tabi'in. Um, however, the vast majority of the companions not only believed but defended him. And there were several instances where Abu Huraira was tested about his um, veracity or his reliability as a narrator of hadith and he passed every time with flying colors. So we have, um, I'll just mention one example. So there was a group of people, lay people, not like, you know, very learned, and they came to Talha ibn Ubaidillah, right? He was a very famous companion, and they said to him, hey, look, they call him by his kunya, oh, father of Muhammad. Have you seen this Yemeni guy? Basically, because Abu Hurairah was from Yemen. So they're talking about Abu Huraira. He's like, he's like, check out, have you have you checked out this Yemeni guy? Are you telling me? If you read the Arabic, it's right here. Are you telling me that he's more knowledgeable about the hadith of the Prophet than you all, than the people of Mecca, the people of Medina? He says further, we heard things from this guy, this Yemeni guy things that we don't hear, hear anybody else saying? Or is it that he's making up stuff? He's directly accusing Abu Huraira of lying. So Talha responds to him. And he says, of course you're going to hear things from him that you haven't heard from us. No doubt. Falashek, he said. He's like, and I'm going to explain to you why. He says, we were people, and by we he means the inhabitants, the people who were from Mecca and Medina. We were people who had houses, we had property, we had livestock, we had work, we had jobs. Then he said, we used to come to the Prophet ﷺ at the two ends of each day, meaning at in the morning and the nighttime. Other than that, they used to be at work, taking care of their business. And he, on the other hand, he was a poor guy. He was a guest. He was a guest. He says, Ala babi Rasulillah. He's like, he was a guest at the door of the Prophet. ﷺ. He said, they were hand in hand together every moment. He says, so no doubt he heard things that we didn't hear. And then he says, and you're not going to find somebody or anybody that has such good in them as Abu Hurairah that would make up stuff about the Prophet So uh, why I bring this up is because a lot of kind of Orientalist doubts are built on like half truths, right? They selectively quote from here and from there that kind of insinuate things, right? So it's like, oh, look, like it's true, for example, that Aisha once questioned Abu Bakr about his, is he making up hadith? 
right? And it's true that Abu that uh, excuse me, Umar threatened to banish Abu Huraira if he kept on focusing on hadith so much. But they don't give you the rest of the of the story, and so they let your mind connect the dots and say, oh, maybe Abu Huraira is not as reliable as I thought he was. But then you learn that Aisha also defended Abu Huraira after the matter became clear to her, after other companions kind of, um, after they vetted him and, you know, cross-referenced what he was saying with, with other things. And Umar actually was threatening everybody to not talk about hadith so much because Umar was concerned that people were abandoning the Qur'an. So that was his, he wasn't doing it to imply that Abu Huraira was lying. He was just somebody who was very concerned about people's relationship with the Qur'an. And in his time, he saw people going overboard with their focus on hadith to the extent that they would neglect the Qur'an. And so he threatened everybody. He wasn't just threatening Abu Huraira because he might be unreliable or something. No, he was threatening everybody. So knowing the whole story kind of helps. All of that because Abu Huraira is the narrator of our seventh hadith. Um, and so that kind of brings full circle everything about him. If you're interested more about the details of his life, you can go back to the recordings, uh, which are on YouTube from last class. This hadith is very short and it's very straightforward. Abu Huraira said that the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah does not look at your figures nor at your attire, but he looks at your hearts and at your accomplishments. Allah does not look at your bodies nor your figures, but he looks at your hearts and your accomplishments or your actions. So we find in many different parts of the Quran and the Hadith kind of the vast difference between the way that Allah accounts for and judges the world, for example, and the criteria that we use. So one of these areas can be seen in his mercy, right? Because Allah, for example, will continue to forgive anybody who comes to him sincerely with repentance, no matter how many times they mess up or make a mistake. As for you and me, you know, twice, three times, maybe I'm really patient. But if you come to me 10 times with the same mistake, there's there's no chance I'm going to be able to be patient. Just like Musa and Khidr, right? Like in Surah Al-Kahf. No, human beings, we're just not, we're not that patient. We're not that merciful. We might be able to, okay, I know I'm supposed to do this and that and the other, but after a certain amount of time, the ruse is up. Also, when it comes to what Allah chooses to write as your reward, that we're going to have a hadith in the same chapter, just a couple hadith later, that tells us that if you intend to do something bad, and then you are you decide to not do it, that Allah writes that as a good deed and rewards you for it. Imagine that you found out that somebody you care about was plotting against you to do something bad to you. And then you learned that they didn't do anything good. They just decided to not do that bad thing to you. You would probably still be upset. I would still be upset. I would no longer trust that person. I sure wouldn't reward that person or give that person anything to encourage them. I'd probably, you know, keep my distance from that person. Right? So we have Allah constantly being more merciful than we can ever imagine, using a different criteria entirely to evaluate who's eligible for mercy and who's, and who's not, or in what scenarios it doesn't apply, or in what scenarios justice dictates something else be done than forgiveness. Right? Because there's mercy in everything Allah does, even in his punishment, though we're not used to thinking about it that way. So this is kind of a, a one of the subtler points behind this hadith is that Allah is using a different criteria. He's weighing us on a different scale than we're weighed in this life between people, between society, especially in the society we live in right now. It's kind of late capitalist society where 
every single one of us is valued in terms of dollars and cents, in terms of productivity. Why do you think our society, and we'll come to this point as well in a few hadith, favors the youth so much more than elders? Because our society in the United States of America views the youth as the future, as eventual producers and consumers, whereas the elderly are no longer productive. They don't contribute to the GDP, right? Their spending habits are marginal. And so they're kind of cast to the side in our society. So Allah is using an entirely different criteria. What's the first question, you know, in non-Muslim culture? What's the first question you get after, hi, what's your name? What do you do? Right? What's your contribution? What's your product productive contribution to the society that we're part of? And as women, you all know, if you choose to be a um, a homemaker, quote unquote, whatever you want to call it, you choose not to have a career, you know, it, we have a kind of different microculture within the, the Muslims, but outside in the outside world, they say, oh, you just stay at home as if it's something that's lesser. And this is no, no disrespect or no um, taking away anything from who has a career. That's a great thing too. But we're worried about everybody having respect, right? And so in general, in general, the career gets the respect because our society values this kind of capitalistic productivity. Whereas if you stay stay at home <laughs> as if you're not doing <laughs> a million things and, and really working is kind of, if it's not looked down upon, it's certainly not looked up to. It doesn't get the, sta the same response as, oh, she's a doctor, like, oh, this is actually something Obama said about Saudi Arabia um, during his presidency. He said something along the lines of, a society will never get ahead if half of its workforce stays home, right? So Obama was using this kind of capitalistic criteria. He's looking at every individual as a potential producer. And so if you're not running at maximum efficiency, you're, not, you're, you're wasting your, your potential. Well, Allah in this hadith looks at us with an entirely different criteria and subjects us to an entirely different calculus. He doesn't look at our bodies. He doesn't look at our forms, our attire. He doesn't look at our capitalistic productivity, what we contribute to the GDP. He looks at our intentions. He looks at your hearts and he looks at your actions and accomplishments, your deeds. And so on the day of judgment, when the reckoning happens, the people who have honor are going to be the people with the pure hearts, the people who tried to purify their hearts, the people who dedicated a good amount of their deeds to Allah, not necessarily to the GDP. So we have an entirely different calculus and criteria. Our next hadith, the eighth hadith, is narrated by Abu Musa al Ash'ari. Abu Musa al Ash'ari is also from Yemen. He has a very similar story, actually, as Abu Huraira. He actually accepted Islam while traveling to Mecca before the Hijrah to Medina. After he accepted Islam, he disappeared. He went back to Yemen to kind of spread Islam among his people. He didn't come back to Medina until around the time that Abu Huraira came to Medina, which was in the year of Khaybar, the seventh year after the Hijra to Medina. And he stayed there with them, with the Muslims, until the conquest of Mecca, which was only a year or so after. Then he returned back to Yemen once more. After the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he fought a lot alongside Umar in the conquest of Persia. 
he was appointed the governor of Basra and then Kufa by Omar. He was one of the quote unquote four judges of the companions. There were four of the companions that were specifically known to be very wise and erudite judges of the law. They were Zayd ibn Thabit, uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, who we're talking about now, and then Umar and Ali. Once the fitna came, the fitna between the killers of Uthman and the fighting between Ali and Muawiyah, he favored non-involvement. And because of that, he was actually removed. He was deposed by the people of Kufa who wanted support wanted to support Ali and his descendants. After that happened, he was made the mediator from Ali's side during arbitration with Muawiyah's side. And after that episode, he died soon after. So the text of the Hadith, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about who fights in the battlefield, who's really doing real jihad, we're talking about outward jihad, not the inner jihad. Somebody who fights out of valor, somebody who fights out of zeal, somebody who fights out of hypocrisy. Which one of these is considered fighting in the cause of Allah, fi sabilillah, as we hear? The Prophet وسلم, he responds, but he responds with neither of the choices that was presented to him. He says, whoever fights so that the word of Allah becomes supreme, he is the one who is considered fighting in the cause of Allah. So here we see a delineation between, again, intention. The entire chapter is about intention. And we know that outward actions have to adhere to law, legal things, right? So like for jihad, there's a lot of legal issues that govern jihad. You cannot fight non-combatants. You cannot be unduly aggressive, right? You have to be responding to a threat in defense or an imminent threat, right? All these other sorts of, you know, you have to respect treaties. You have to, it has to be through the authorities. You can't, there's no vigilante violence. You can't cut down a tree. You can't destroy a building. You can't even hurt animals or, or the elderly or monks or religious people. All these sorts of rules that govern the outward practice of legitimate jihad. And this hadith is talking about governing the inward aspect of jihad, which has to do with your intention. Because just as somebody can make sujood and intend by that sujood to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody can be making sujood right next to them and be intending to show off or seem really pious or take a selfie of themselves and put it on TikTok and, you know, try to catch the attention of some young guy or young girl. Right? It has to do with the inner dimension, what's your, why are you doing this? And so just as with the sujood and with the prayer, even something as kind of worldly in some sense as jihad has its outward laws and limits, rules, guidelines, and it has its inward criteria as well. So the inward criteria is that you're not fighting for even courage, even bravery, even to, you know, so you can go back and tell your bros how brave you were, or how you know awesome it was. And especially not if you're doing it out of hypocrisy, but it's only to serve Allah. It's only to serve Allah and to ensure that the guidance that Allah provided to human beings remains on earth and remains accessible to people. Some might ask, right, in our society, right, where we kind of skew, skew pacifist in the U.S., especially because we've seen so many times where violence goes wrong, where war goes wrong. You know, we live in a country that commits war crimes and gets away with it. You know, it's very, it's not controversial. Everybody knows it. 
so we get kind of squeamish. It's like, oh, wait a second. We're talking about war. We're talking about fighting. We're talking about all this sort of stuff. There's so many examples of how to do it wrong. But that doesn't mean that categorically it's a wrong thing. It has to be under strict guidelines and strict rules. It has to be reined in and it has to be done with the right intention. And if it is, then it can be, it can be a force for good. There are poor and oppressed people in this world that need defending. And the guidance that Allah has provided, it would be so easily lost if no one were to ever defend that. To defend that guidance or defend, to keep that light alive, Allah's word, so that other people could at least have the opportunity to make up their own minds. If Muslims were just turn the other cheek, as Allah says in the Quran, it would end up being that all mosques, all churches, all temples, all religion would cease to be. All of the most crass and callous and ruthless people would reign supreme and would oppress. So we have been given the right to defend ourselves, both individually and on a societal level. Okay, that is just over half of the class. So on to, and anybody has any questions, of course, pop them in the chat box or unmike yourself and speak. Any questions are always welcome. No topic is off. No topic is off topic and no question is too controversial. So we're talking about marriage and I addressed something that one of the sisters had brought up uh, last time about what's the ruling of marriage in the first place and the pressure that's put on converts to marry right away and I, how I think that's a terrible idea in general, in general, you know, making major life decisions within a year or two from making another life decision that's going to change everything is kind of a recipe for disaster. There's exceptional cases, there's success stories, but I wouldn't really recommend it as a default rule. I think that people who are new to Islam should try to stay put, refrain from making major life decisions if they can help it, and kind of reassess where they're at once they're more comfortable with their Muslim identities. It's certainly not a requirement. I know that in some Muslim uh, communities, it's like a woman who becomes a Muslim who doesn't have a, uh, who's not married, it's like, oh my God, get her married right now. Uh, that's not, in my opinion, that's not typically in the woman's best interest. But today we've got a lot more juicy issues to get to because we have entered the meat and potatoes of the, the book of marriage. And it has to do with um, the prerequisites or the conditions that make a marriage valid. Okay, now there's three primary conditions. Each of those conditions is going to take up at least one class because there's some juicy issues to talk about. The first condition is wilaya, guardianship. The second condition is shahada, witnessing a marriage contract. We talked about secret marriages. Uh, somebody asked about secret marriages last class. It doesn't look like we'll get to it this class, but We'll get into more specifics next class or the class after, inshallah. And the third condition of marriage is the mahr, which is the dowry, paid from the man to the woman. So right there, from a female perspective, you need to know that you have these three rights, that they are conditions of the marriage, okay? Guardianship, witnesses, dowry. We'll get into the differences of opinion, but just to make it easy, if a marriage is conducted without one of these three things, throw it out. It's just ink on paper. It's not worth anything, right? And anybody coming to a woman, trying to convince them to, to cut corners or to kind of, you know, not worry about not having one of these three things, uh-uh, nope. That's a red flag. <laughs> so we said, red flag. Oh, but sister, you know, we need to make the, the marriage easy. So, you know, you can just accept, you know, something very, very small for your dowry. 
Is it permissible? We'll get into that. Is it best practice? As a default, no, it's not. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why Islamic law gives the woman a dowry. It's called an insurance policy, right? But that will get there. First condition is wilaya, wilaya or guardianship. So what's the idea behind guardianship? The idea behind guardianship is that the world of men can be a treacherous place, that men can lie and fudge the truth in order to get what they want out of a woman. And so there should be a male relative or a male party who has the best interest of the woman in mind in order to deal with this male sphere, this male world, keep them at bay, keep them straight, and prevent abuse, deception, or anything like that. That's the wisdom behind the concept of wilay. It's not trying to imply that women are weak or that women are less intelligent or that they're incapable or that they're naive. No, not at all. It's about Islamic law understands that marriage works when there is accountability because the purpose of marriage in the first place is to have accountability. You are accountable to this other person. You're accountable when it comes to the, the consequences. Now you have a kid. Now you have responsibilities. The man has to pay this. The woman's obliged to do this. And we'll get into all of that. But this accountability is the key aspect of marriage. It has to be safeguarded. And so in order to establish that accountability, the institution of guardianship exists. Does a woman always need a guardian? That's something else. We talked last class about how a woman with who already has experience, whether through marriage or sexual experience, depending on what school of thought you're following, does not require this guardianship. So the guardianship is intended for women who are unexperienced. They're not quite used to having to deal with men, right? Even in American culture, even in American culture, women are kind of more naive about the nature of men than they should be. They did a study recently. I think it was Stanford. I'm not sure. It was a study about, so the, what they, it was a brilliant study. They took co-ed friends, okay? Friends that were in college that were men and women, okay? Pairs. And they split them up and they swore them to secrecy. They said, you guys cannot talk about any of the questions, any of the responses, anything to each other once you're out of this study. It's a condition of the study. And then they asked each side their feelings about, did they have romantic feelings for the other one, right? And then they asked, would, if you knew that the other party had romantic feelings for you, would you be open to a romantic relationship? What did that study find? That study found that women tended to think that they were really actually just friends with the guys. And at the same time, the guys consistently thought that they had a shot at a romantic relationship with the girl. Consistently. So this even like even people who grow up, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, this thing is normal to them, the non-Muslims. Even still, there's this kind of naivety that goes on about, it's the age old question, can guys and girls be friends, right? When it comes to that level of friendship, like, you know, usually the guy's in it for a potential romantic relationship and the woman is innocent and thinks that it's just innocent. She has no idea. So because of that, guardianship exists. What are the conditions of a guardian? There is scholarly consensus that a guardian has to be a Muslim. He has to be um, have 
surpass the age of puberty. And he has to be a man because, again, we're talking about dealing with the sphere of men. So it would be self-defeating if it was a young kid or it would be self-defeating if it was another woman. And he must be a Muslim because, as we see in the society, our religion pushes us to think about these things, right? So if you have a guardian who's not from this kind of thing that we have going on in Islam, they might not see the big deal. Indeed, if we look at the predominant American culture, they don't find it a big deal. They consider it sexual exploration, exploring your sexuality. Go ahead and date this one and the other one and the third and go upstairs and have fun and I'll be down here when you're done. Yeah, that's actually American society. I'm sure Dana could back me up here. That's the American society I grew up in. Anyway, so the guardian has to be Muslim. He has to be uh, surpassed puberty and he has to be uh, a he. He has to be a man. <clears throat> Let's see. What else? Uh, da, 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 da. <clears throat> These things are not really applicable. I'm trying again not to give you uh, an exhaustive issue by issue, but only the things that are applicable to this age. Okay. What? Let's say, okay, a doubt that comes up. A doubt that comes up. We know that sometimes there are oppressive guardians that happens there are guardians who do not let their children get married when they should when somebody who comes to them makes a proposal a respectable young man with good intent some fathers some guardians are so jealous were so extreme that they will prevent their daughter from marrying until the daughter is basically too old for marriage. This happens. Does the woman have a way out? Absolutely. In the Sharia? Absolutely. The scholars have consensus that if someone's guardian is being, is receiving or being proposed to for a certain woman and he is unjustly keyword unjustly unduly without reason refusing that woman to be married we're talking everything's in place it's a reasonable dowry it's a reasonable prospect and he refuses then he can, will forfeit his guardianship. His guardianship will be taken away from him and will be given to the Sultan, if you're in a Muslim country, the Imam, if you're in a Muslim community center, whoever can represent the best interests of the woman. So we have here, again, all of these things, the, the guardianship, the witnesses, the dowry, they're all about what's in the best interest of especially the bride. What's going to protect her? What's going to protect her rights? What's going to stop her from getting taken advantage of? The system of guardianship exists to protect her interests. If someone tries to use the institution of guardianship against her interests, Islamic law says take that guardianship away and give it to somebody else. And this was actually the act of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is also scholarly consensus that a woman can refuse to be married to somebody if somebody is trying to marry her off against her will. Especially if there is asymmetry, a non-suitability when it comes to people's religious, re, comparative religiosity. 
you have somebody who makes all their five daily prayers, a woman who makes all their five daily prayers. Her father is trying to marry her off to somebody who doesn't pray. There's consensus that that woman can refuse. If you're saying like, why is it just for the issues of suitability? Because last class we talked about the difference of opinion. We talked about how, in my opinion, the stronger and preponderant opinion is that a woman always has her right to refuse. And this is actually, again, the act of the Prophet Muhammad She can't be forced. But there were some scholars who disagreed if there's suitability in religion. But if there's not suitability in religion, all of the scholars agree that she can say no, she can refuse everything. And it actually goes vice versa. What if the woman just became a Muslim? She's not really that practicing. And the father wants to marry her off to, you know, the Sheikh of Azhar or wherever. She has the right to refuse. The scholars also agree that one of the most, that a valid criteria for evaluating suitability is piety, is religiosity. And they disagree about every other characteristic or quality, whether it's money, whether it's um, lineage, family, all this other stuff, we'll get into it. But they agree, there's consensus that piety is a valid criteria to judge whether two people are suitable in marriage or not. And they also agree in consensus that beauty is not a valid <laughs> criteria to judge suitability. So if two people are in love and one of them happens to be very attractive and the other not so, there is no legal grounds to refuse the two from being married at all, even on the, according to the opinion that anybody would even have a say in that in the first place. Those are all the points of consensus. And we start with points of consensus because they give you your terrain. We've exhausted all of our, our time on this. So next time we'll get into the areas of different differences of opinion concerning uh, wilaya, concerning guardianship, specific issues. Um, does anybody have any questions quickly before we close out the class or it's closed on us? And as always, if anybody has a question, you're up in the middle of the night and you think of a question, you can WhatsApp me, you can text me, uh, or you can text the women's WhatsApp group. You can hit me on Facebook. You can hit my email, anything at all. Uh, you want to keep it anonymous. You want me to talk about something in class. No problem. I mean, okay, I'll see you guys uh, next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.